maybe before you arrive in the war, uh, you, you think you're going to be glorious. You think it's all going to be kind of adventure. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be, uh, you know, everything's going to be fine. I'm immortal. Nobody's going to kill me. Somebody else will get killed. But then when you face the reality of it, when you're really in it, then you start thinking, I'm mortal. I can be killed. I can die. This is scary. I want to go home. You know, I mean, it's, it's uh, you change. I agonized over the over over the plans for Desert Storm for for the final ground offensive. I mean, I used to lie awake at night over and over again, thinking, "Is there something I've forgotten? Is there something we haven't done right?" I I drilled the staff mercilessly. We went drilled and drilled and drilled, and I drilled my subordinate commanders mercilessly to go over things over and over and over again to make sure we we hadn't hadn't missed something, because I didn't want to, you know. Wake up four days into the war and find out we had 20,000 casualties on our hands, and it was our fault because we had we had not done something right, or we had been too lazy, or too careless, or too stupid. We were moving at night, which was the absolute most horrible thing you could do in a country like that to move through the jungle at night, especially a guy from Akron. War is a whole lot more complex than we are led to believe when when we learn it in school. I think it's important for the society to realize that every time it goes to war, it sells off a piece of its soul. to active duty is one that has been heard by millions of American men and women since the creation of our nation. Some have answered the call voluntarily, others have been drafted, and all have become an indelible part of our country's history. You know, I tell people freedom is not cost free. You pay a high price for freedom. And you know, you pay it in the, in the, the blood and the limbs and the lives of, of our service members. Who have, who have fought for freedom and for this country. Wars are made up of many battles, some large and many small. Whether the battle is fought in a beautiful tropical location or in a historic European village, all wars exact a toll on its participants. Some participants pay this toll with their lives to die with honor, defending democracy and fighting oppression. You know, they sacrificed their today so we could have our tomorrows. There's, not, there's no glory in it. We do have heroes, of course. Uh, but war is obscene. And you, you, the boys on the battlefield, they saw this obscenity. And they saw even more of it when they went into the concentration camps. They, they saw Hitler's obscenity. So you don't glorify it, but you do remember the people. Others pay the toll of war with lifelong illnesses or disabilities. Many of these veterans spend years regaining abilities they once had or learning skills that will allow them to adapt to their new circumstances. These veterans are forced to deal on a daily basis with the results of their participation in battle. You don't know what freedom is until you don't have freedom. And the people of Vietnam, they did not have freedom. The people of foreign countries, that are that, the, the freedom, freedom as they say, you gotta love it as your life. Because I did put my life on the line for my freedom. And I appreciate every doggone day of just being in this country, just being able to uh, draw a breath of air. You just can't understand the horror of war, the horror. Like they say in the Second World War, we did this and we did that. In the Korean War, we did this, we did that. And in Vietnam, they did so much. But when that bullet hits your bone, I don't care what war you're in, it hurts. And it hurts terrible. And it leaves scars right through you, right through your soul. That's what that bullet did. It went right through my soul. Lastly, there are those veterans who pay the price of war throughout their lifetime by simply carrying with them the memories of battle and horror that they witnessed. 
I don't think you ever forget, and I, I think it's um, one of those memories that stands taller than all others. It's um, if you try not to think of it, you think of it. If you you know if you try to think of it, you think of it. If you try to just be neutral and you don't care one way or the other, you still think of it. Um, you just have to learn to carry it. It's just another load in life. You know, it's, life's not fair sometimes. You just go on. There's things that happen every day. It brings memories back. Much you try to forget. Uh, or just something that happens. Somebody say something or do something. Uh, it's, I don't think you ever forget. But the one thing that helps is to talk about it. A lot of people want to talk. I wouldn't talk about it for 30 years. It is all of these people who we honor with memorials and monuments, special days, and tributes. Two of the better known American tributes are Memorial Day and Veterans Day. Both of these tributes were created in honor of our war veterans, but each has its own unique place in history. The origins of Memorial Day are the oldest, dating back to the Civil War. From 1861 to 1865, the United States was embroiled in a bitter struggle within its own borders, trying to resolve a conflict which had clearly divided our nation. After four years and nearly 500,000 deaths, the American Civil War ended, leaving our country united once more. In 1868, three years after the Civil War ended, the Grand Army of the Republic established Decoration Day. This would be a time for the nation to decorate the graves of the war dead with flowers in remembrance of their service. Decoration Day was given the date of May 30th by Major General John A. Logan, and the first large observance was held at Arlington National Cemetery across the Potomac River from Washington, D.C. This cemetery held the remains of over 20,000 Union dead, as well as several hundred Confederate dead. When I was a young man growing up, I can still remember the poppies that, that the people would be wearing in the streets. You know, you could walk down the street and people were... American Legion, people like that were selling poppies, and I, and I remember going out and, and seeing the, the cemeteries with the flags placed on, and not just the military cemeteries, but cemeteries all over this country where people were recognizing the fact that there were, there were men and women out there who had, in fact, died to make America the country it is today. And, and that's what's important about Memorial Day, to remember, as I said before, Freedom is not cost-free. It's paid for. It's bought and paid for with the lives and the blood and the limbs of, of, of our armed forces. And, and it's not, there's nothing wrong with once a year stopping to pause and remember that. And then maybe to say thank you. After World War I, Decoration Day was expanded to one of those who have died in all the different American wars. In 1971, Decoration Day was officially renamed Memorial Day and, by an act of Congress, declared a national federal holiday to be celebrated on the last Monday of May. The origins of special observances, like Memorial Day, which honor those who die in war, can be found in abundance throughout history. The uh, Vietnam Veterans Memorial has a number of factors sort of converge to bring about an individual and collective healing for military veterans who are over there they, they see the names of their buddies they see their own reflection and uh, think about how lucky they were to have survived and how unlucky their friends were and uh, many times just seeing the names and touching these names helps them heal individually but uh, for the nation as well, this is a symbol of healing and reconciliation that was supported by many people who both opposed and favored the Vietnam War. And I will never forget my first trip to the wall. I approached it, as many veterans do, very, very slowly, um, not knowing what was going to happen to me as I, as I came up to it. And I can remember I... Right at the entrance to, to the wall, there is a uh, book of everyone whose name is listed there, and uh, it has a plexiglass uh, shield over it. And, and I came up to it, and I, my, my strongest memory is of standing there trying to read that book, 
but my tears were bouncing off the plexiglass. I was crying so much, and I had to wait and, and, until I got through that before I could even look up their names. But the world soon came to realize that honoring those who served and lived was equally important. It was this feeling which would eventually create Veterans Day, but not until the end of the fighting that at the time would be considered the war to end all wars. In 1914, fighting began in the Balkans, which created the eventual European showdown between two hostile alliances. The Central Powers, consisting of Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Turkey, and the Allies made up of France, Russia, and Great Britain. On the Western Front, Germany battled its way through Belgium, advancing on Paris and then the English Channel. There was tough resistance during the Battle of the Marne and Ypres, and the Germans became stalled. Battles continued, however, seeing the introduction of 20th century artillery. We also began to see air attacks, first by zeppelins, then later by aircraft and the first attack using poison gas. Well, you know, it, the technology that we use in the armed forces is a product of evolving technology that's used throughout the world. Uh, you know, we just happen to be able to take advantage of some of that technology to go ahead and perhaps not put as many human beings at risk as we might otherwise. So, you know, that, that's exactly why the aircraft and the zeppelins came about in World War I, and that's why you know, we have the stealth bombers and, and uh, this sort of thing and very high, highly technical uh, armored vehicles in, in the Gulf War that also, you know, help to save lives. So the, you've got to be careful because in the Gulf War, the thing I used to get upset about more than anybody else is they'd say this is a Nintendo game war. And you have to remember that despite all of that technology, it's human beings who are involved. It's human beings who are in the stealth bomber. It's human beings who are in those armored personnel carriers and that sort of thing. And ultimately, it comes down to human beings risking their lives and making the critical decisions. I don't think we'll ever get to the day where on the battlefield the decisions are being made by robots and computers and that sort of thing. It's always going to involve human beings. It's always going to be human beings that lose their lives. So, yes, technology is there. We use technology, hopefully, to help us get it over with faster and to win our objectives, but, but in the bottom line to the whole thing is it's people. In 1915, the British ship Lusitania was sunk by a German submarine, which caused the naval superiority of Britain to be questioned. In 1916, the battles continued, despite huge casualties at Verdun and in the Somme offensive. In 1917, the United States joined this war on the side of the Allies with General Pershing landing the American Expeditionary Force in France. With this addition of manpower, the Allies were ultimately successful in stopping the Germans just short of Paris in the Second Battle of the Marne. The war came quickly to a close after that, with the Central Powers surrendering to the Allies in 1918. The armistice ending the war was signed in a railway coach near the battle zone in France. This armistice was signed at 11 o'clock in the morning on November 11, 1918, thereafter being known as the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. It was at this time that the United States, England, and France all chose to honor those who served, and especially those who died, by burying an unknown soldier at a revered national site. In 1921, America's unknown was entombed at Arlington National Cemetery. England's unknown was placed in Westminster Abbey and France's near the Arc de Triomphe. These memorial ceremonies all took place on November 11th. It was at this point in time that this day gained its name of Armistice Day. I, of course, grew up hearing a lot about World War I. And Veterans Day at that point in time was really much more important. I remember in school having a few minutes of silence at 11 o'clock and so forth. As November 11th would now always be remembered with significance, so would Arlington National Cemetery. The Tomb of the Unknown Soldier located there soon became a site of pilgrimage, both for veterans and for the families of wounded or dead soldiers. This was a place where they could show reverence for those who served 
and where they could console each other in their mutual memories and grief. In June of 1926, Congress officially recognized Armistice Day. Twelve years later, in 1938, Armistice Day officially became a national holiday. Ideally, if World War I had truly been the war to end all wars, perhaps November 11th would still be named Armistice Day. However, just a few years later, war broke out in Europe, the start of World War II. World War II was fought between the Allies, made up of the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union, and the Axis powers, predominantly Germany, Japan, and Italy. Since World War I, militaristic regimes had been on the rise in these Axis countries, and in 1939, Germany, under the leadership of Adolf Hitler, stepped forward and invaded Poland. France and Great Britain immediately declared war on Germany, officially beginning World War II. Hitler quickly overtook not only Poland, but Norway and Denmark as well, and by 1940 France had also surrendered to Germany. This left Great Britain, under the leadership of Prime Minister Winston Churchill, to fight on its own. In 1941, Germany went on to invade the Soviet Union, thereby breaking the non-aggression pact it had previously signed with them in 1939. This act of aggression by Germany brought the Soviet Union, under the leadership of Premier Joseph Stalin, into the conflict on the side of the Allies. On December 7, 1941, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, bringing the United States into the war. Yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Pearl Harbor, there it was, and my ship was just disappearing then, and uh, uh, it had gotten away. But the rest of the, or all of the others, uh, terrible damages. The, Arizona is the one I think everyone knows really blew up. About 1,300 out of 1,500 would kill. The uh, Nevada uh, was strafed and all. We lost about 150 men. And I got a boat to the California, which was a, one of the other ships, and it was in terrible shape. It was sinking in the mud. And uh, we fumbling around maybe, but... Uh, rescuing, getting people down, get, getting them out from the lower, lower decks, and uh, it, it was confusion, but uh, everyone was doing everything they could, the oil burning, burning on the water, and so forth. At first, the Allies suffered at the hands of the Axis powers, but in 1942, British General Montgomery began to push back Rommel's offensive in North Africa. That mission was over northern Italy, which I considered a milk run. We got shot down on that mission. We got hit so badly that uh, our right wing was just about cut off, and we found ourselves, we were in a spin and tumbling at the same time. And during that time, I had given the order to bail out, plus I rang the alarm bell, which meant bail out, and I was a little... I had a guilt complex about it. I asked the tail gunner who did get out whether he, whether he got the uh, message to bail out. He said, yes, that made me feel a little better because I lost seven guys in that, on that mission, seven out of ten. We were only flying with ten then. From there, I, was ta I landed uh, near a, uh, a German intelligence outfit. That was the first guy to interrogate me was an American. Or at least he spoke English like an American. Well, I convinced this fellow that not to look at my dog tags because it had an H on it, which meant Hebrew, Jew. And I was concerned about it. And uh, I convinced him. I had studied uh, German in high school, and I took a year in college. And uh, I could remember some of the places in Berlin, some of the street names and what have you that I studied, 
And so I told him I had visited Berlin in 1936. Now, no Jew would go to Berlin in 1936. So he assumed I was German. And in fact, he reprimanded me. He said, what are you doing fighting for the Americans? You should be fighting for the Vaterland. Italy surrendered in 1943. While in the Pacific, the United States had won significant naval battles in the Coral Sea and at Midway and had landed on Guadalcanal. Then we started on the, uh, the march out of a town. We had no idea where we were going. We just walked, and uh, uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes at night they would uh, just we'd lay down on the road, and uh, sometimes we'd uh, they just let us sit in the hot sun in the daytime and march at night, and uh, it was just uh, we'd ask about food, food. They'd say food next town, food next town, but then when we got to the next town, there was never any food. And so you got hungry. But after, after three or four days, you really don't miss it. You, you start getting weak, yes. But you don't miss the fact that you got an empty stomach. That uh, a good meal would probably kill you. <laughs> so uh, then, uh, now, what, uh, along there, uh, the route of the march, the Filipino women and the children used to stand on the side of the road uh, looking for their, their husbands, uh, their their uh, sons, uh, their friends, and uh, they saw the shape that we were in, and they tried to uh, uh, toss us food, and they would wrap uh, oh uh, rice and different things in banana leaves and throw it to us, but then when the Japs saw them doing it, uh, a lot of the times they would uh, beat the women with a rifle butt, or uh, bayonet them or shoot them just for trying to help us. And uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the people continued to help us in spite of that. Only they were there a lot more careful. And then then uh, the fellows started uh, uh, dropping uh, with malaria. We all had malaria, and no medicine. And the uh, as we'd walked a long way, some of the fellows had just collapse. Well, they weren't allowed to get up. The Japs would just kick them off the side of the road and either bayonet them or shoot them. The U.S. forces continued their offensive using an island-hopping strategy in the Pacific under the leadership of General MacArthur. This strategy eventually took them to Japan's doorstep after the significant battles of Iwo Jima and Okinawa. Uh, Iwo Jima was a 26-day operation. I was there 25 days. Iwo Jima was important because it had three airports. Uh, two of them... Um, were in operation. The Japanese had two in operation. One they were building. Um, before I left the island, uh, we were we were landing our planes on the island, B-29s, which were big planes and required a lot of space, and uh, they were able to land. So the whole uh, reason for taking Iwo was to have a landing space for planes coming out of Saipan and Tinian bombing Japan because they didn't have enough fuel to get them all the way back to uh, Saipan. On June 6, 1944, now known as D-Day, the final Allied campaign began in Europe with the landing of troops in Normandy, France. We had orders set so that when D-Day was uh, signaled, we, that was, we had a job already set up to haul people to the beach. That's basically infantry. They had a red ball highway in the sky. They were going down one way, just, you can't believe, almost constant airplanes were going down different kinds. Some were fighters, some were bombers. On where the 8th Air Force was, uh, the uh, P-39s or whatever they were, the little ones uh, with the tiger painted on the front, when they took off, they were going right out over us about 200 feet up. <laughs> And, and, and they were all under power, you know, and, and it was a very impressive uh, sight, but uh, how anybody could survive so many airplanes, it was amazing. On D-Day, I was located uh, at the port, uh, and all the ships were returning at that time, uh, and uh, lo and behold, on board each of the ships were thousands of body bags, 
And as I saw that, I just couldn't believe my eyes because that was at 10, 11 o'clock that morning. They were already returning thousands of young men enclosed in a body, a body bag uh, container. And it certainly shook me uh, considerably. But my little Jeep had a uh, uh, pipe put under from the carburetor up above my head and, and a tailpipe up above my head and I never didn't realize why they were so high. I always noticed they were 15 inches above my head, but I never thought it was important until they took me across on a boat, big boat, and lifted us off and put us down in the uh, uh, landing craft tank. And we were right up on the gate. And I was informed that when the gong sounded, the gate would go down. And so I had to have my Jeep in low gear four-wheel drive, third throttle, and take off. Well, I knew I had to take off because there was big trucks behind me. And, uh, but I had thought that we'd go out and the tires might get wet. But we drove headed for shore. We must have been 150 yards out when we hit a sandbar. And uh, there was a big gong and the gate went down. And the next thing I know, I dropped into water right up to here. And now I knew why those pipes were up so high. They weren't worried about me breathing. <laughs> it was make sure that the truck didn't stall. In May of 1945, after Hitler's suicide, the leadership of Germany collapsed and surrendered. Whenever we captured German prisoners, they were just like us. They didn't want war. They were just as friendly as could be. The only ones who weren't were, of course, the SS troopers. You know, they were brainwashed. But uh, the regular German GI like us, you, Jesus, you could go put your arm around him, go have a few beers with him. You know, and here he's killing you, and you're trying to kill him. Uh, there were no indications of of uh, night signage or otherwise that I was entering the Buchenwald camp, and I didn't know it at the time. Uh, we knew nothing about the concentration camps. It was never uh, discussed, so it was strictly a prisoner of war camp. And upon entry, of course, all these Germans uh, had departed, uh, and uh, you had these poor individuals who were just being uh, starved to death and uh, getting ready to send them on into the ovens. Uh, this came as a shock to us. We knew of prisoners, but not knowing that they were starving them to death and burning them. Uh, the war was over in Europe, but the battles continued in the Pacific. In August of 1945, President Truman ordered the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. That bomb has more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. The Japanese began the war from the air at Pearl Harbor. They have been repaid many fold, and the end is not yet. We are now prepared to destroy more rapidly and completely every productive enterprise the Japanese have in any city. We shall destroy their docks, their factories, and their communications. Let there be no mistake. We shall completely destroy Japan's power to make war. A week after Hiroshima, a bomb was dropped on the city of Nagasaki, Japan, finally bringing a Japanese surrender on August 14, 1945. The National Broadcasting Company has interrupted all of its program schedules to bring you the historic announcement of the Japanese surrender. The Japanese are now leaving with a surrender document and from aboard the flagship USS Missouri, where the formal surrender of Japan has just taken place, we switch you now to the White House in Washington. The thoughts and hopes of all America, indeed of all the civilized world, are centered tonight on the battleship Missouri. There, on that small piece of American soil, anchored in Tokyo Harbor, the Japanese have just officially laid down their arms. They have signed terms of unconditional surrender. We take you now from the White House in Washington to the Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers in the Pacific, General of the Army, Douglas MacArthur. Today the guns are silent. A great tragedy has ended. 
a great victory has been won. The skies no longer rain death. The seas bear only commerce. Men everywhere walk upright in the sunlight. The entire world lies quietly at peace. The uh, Japanese commander uh, came out while we were lining up to get ready to walk up to the mine and said, uh, there will be no work this morning. We'll go to work this afternoon. Okay. Good. This is the first time this has happened in a long time, not going to work. Something's wrong. And that afternoon, we lined up to go to work, and he came out and said, no work until tomorrow. We lined up the next morning, all kinds of speculation going around. Um, so next morning, he told us the war was over. And uh, uh, he, uh, he knew that uh, we were going to want more food, and he said, I, I will try to, try to get you more food and this and that, and uh, put us in charge of our officers. And the first thing they asked for was some cans of yellow paint and, uh, and brushes, and sent a number of the fellows up on the roof of our barracks and painted Hanawa the name of the town we were in, 550 POWs on the roof, because we knew an observation plane would be over. And within a week or so, an observation plane did fly over, and we didn't see it. And we, we, we heard it come and we heard it go, but oh no, they didn't see us. That afternoon, a half a dozen U.S. Navy torpedo planes came up the valley and uh, circled the camp and uh, dropped out a message saying that uh, when the uh, Observation plane had been over that morning taking pictures, and they developed that they saw this writing on one of the buildings, and they uh, enlarged it, and it was Hanawa 550 POWs. They came back to investigate. And they said, we can't drop anything for you now, but we have, a, we have already radioed Saipan, and your supplies, the B-29s, will bring your supplies up tomorrow. Your food, your clothes, your medicine. Over 16 and a half million Americans took part in World War II, with over 400,000 of them dying in service. This was the greatest mobilization of soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen in the nation's history, far exceeding our participation in World War I. When World War II ended, one of the results of that armistice was the division of Korea into two new countries, North Korea, occupied by the Soviet Union, and South Korea occupied by the United States. In June of 1950, just five years after World War II, North Korea invaded South Korea, once again bringing the United States into war. This is Korea, a nation divided at the end of World War II at the 38th parallel. In North Korea, the Soviet Union lost no time in setting up a communist puppet government. In the South, the United States and the United Nations strove to establish an independent democratic republic. The attack by the North Korean communists came suddenly and without warning. The heroic Republican army, faced by superior forces with all the advantages of deception and surprise, rallied to the defense of the republic. Improvising quickly to meet the unprovoked aggression, Korean Republican troops were thrown against the invaders south of the 38th parallel. Against a prepared enemy armed with modern tanks, planes, and guns, the Republican troops were ill-equipped to meet the onslaught. The majority of the fighting centered on the 38th parallel, which was where the dividing border of the two countries had originally been drawn. You would, had your long hand under drawers on, and your wool shirts, and your, another pair of pants, and your big parka, and uh, ear flaps on you, and wrapped a scarf around you. And, and you tied your sleeping bag on you, and it was altogether different. I say the terrain was a big thing, and there was no way anybody was going to charge up a hill like John Wayne with his bayonet fixed and wipe out somebody, because by the time you got to the top of that hill, you was ready to lay down and go to sleep or take a break with the, the cold air that you were breathing in there. It was, that was the bad thing about it, the weather and, uh, and the terrain there. Uh, we were dealing with uh, temperatures about 30 below zero, and that was before a wind chill, and today I guess that would amount to about 65 degrees below zero. We were having problem with our weapons. The Cosmoline was set up in them, our artillery pieces, the 105s and 155s, when they let a round out, 
it would literally uh, mushroom the muzzle and it looked like a giant blunderbuster. Uh, and uh, the carbine that they had that was primarily carrying by, uh, carried by NCOs and officers, uh, that was just, it just wouldn't fire in the cold weather. And uh, the fact that we couldn't get out of the cold weather, and this was well over 15 days that we were out, we could get our, they would permit us to put our feet in sleeping bags. And at night, if you're on the reverse slope and had the ability for total uh, coverage, they would let you build a little bonfire. But for the most part, uh, the guys really struggled with the cold weather over there. And probably a good part of our uh, casualties came from frostbite. A ceasefire was eventually established in July of 1953 in the city of Panmunjom. My fellow citizens, tonight we greet with prayers of thanksgiving the official news that an armistice signed almost an hour ago in Korea. It will quickly bring to an end the fighting between the United Nations forces and the Communist Army. For this nation, the cost of repelling aggression has been high. In thousands of homes, it has been incalculable. It has been paid in terms of tragedy. This war followed about five years after the end of World War II. And there were still a lot of the GIs still adjusting to civilian life. And there were additionally the uh, location of this, as President Truman called it, this police action. Uh, was in a place that probably 75% of the American people never heard of, and that was Korea. And so I think that we got kind of overwhelmed in the uh, picture by the Second World War, and it really wasn't a war in terms of President Truman. It was a police action. So in spite of all the bloodshed and killing that took place over there, uh, the people just did not recognize it as a for real war. If we don't stop the flow of communism uh, in Korea, uh, then it's going to move into Japan and the Philippines and, and possibly into the Hawaiian Islands and it could come to the United States. So if we're going to stop it, we need to stop it in a country uh, like Korea uh, rather than permit it to continue to expand across the world. And I think we accomplished that. Realizing that peace was equally preserved by veterans of World War II and Korea, Congress decided that veterans of all these conflicts needed to be honored, not just those of World War I. It was at this time that Congress amended the Act of 1938, which created Armistice Day, by striking out the word armistice and inserting the word veterans. So in 1954, November 11th became a day to honor American veterans of all wars. The kids in North Korea were taught how to throw hand grenades and fire an AK-47. Our kids are taught how to throw football and catch baseballs and swing a bat. And I think that's a lot of the difference between the two countries and themselves. That uh, Communism has absolutely nothing to offer. There's, there's no incentive for anyone to get ahead. It's one thing I did. And it made me understand communism. I think maybe the three years I spent there, uh, the good that come out of it really made me realize what we have and why we fight so hard to protect it. In 1954, a year after the Korean armistice, a conflict began in Southeast Asia, which was to become known as the Vietnam War. The Geneva Conference had divided Vietnam into two countries, South Vietnam, aided by the United States, and North Vietnam, aided by the Communists. It was October the 19th, 1969. It was about, I don't know, 40 days or so before I went home. An enemy, enemy machine gunner uh, shot, gun, you know, shot his weapon, he was a 30 cal. I was pretty low. I was following a hunter-killer little uh, Hughes aircraft, this machine gun opened up on me and just unfortunately bad luck, the bullets went into my ammo bay and I had 300 grenades in my ammo bay and there was a huge explosion. There was a small floor between me and the ammo bay down under my feet. It was hollow. I had my 
flight controls, push-pull tube controls that work the rotor blades where I steered and everything with a cyclic. Well, the floor crushed, and then when it crushed, it jammed the push-pull tubes to this control, and I lost my cyclic completely. Uh, I was in a dive. I was gaining speed. I was trying to pull the stick back, and I couldn't. And um, I looked at the ground in front of me, of course, th thinking this is it. Uh, I'm going to bury a great big hole right in the ground right there. So I started pulling the power back in, and I leveled it. Just as I pulled it out of the dive, I was probably going somewhere around 70 miles an hour. And um, I was stuck in a right turn, heading straight for the guy that shot us in the first place. I was trying to figure out a way to hide behind the dash or something. I just knew the bullets was just going to rip through any second. We were just slowly getting closer and closer and closer. And I figured, I, I was looking towards the machine gun, and I figured I'd see the muzzle flash that started boiling out of it and the smoke boiling out. And um, he never shot. We went right over the top of him. He never did shoot. And we never knew why. But uh, we flew almost um, 20 miles, banging along sideways with no controls. And I knew I couldn't fly anymore. I knew the ship would never fly anymore. So I just bottom collected. I was afraid I'd crash into the camp. It landed itself. Somehow. It was communist-led guerrillas, also known as the Viet Cong, who were trying to overthrow the South Vietnamese government. I was on a combat patrol, and um, there was a number of us. I think there was about seven or eight of us. And I hit a tripwire and um, got pretty much a whole left side of my body. What happens is military rounds come in. Sometimes they don't go off. This was a 105, which was a pretty big round that uh, the Viet Cong had uh, booby-trapped, set up to an explosive, and uh, set it up to a tripwire. Many, uh, many of my comrades hit those type of things. There were a lot of booby traps in Vietnam. And um, I got the brunt of it, but I think it hit about four or five of us. Luckily, a helicopter was going over, um, heard the explosion and uh, was able to come down, get me, and take me back to a uh, uh, military hospital. Got me treated right away. And that's the difference between Vietnam and some of the other previous wars. Um, because of the helicopters and uh, quick evacs, uh, many injuries that would have resulted in death, we ended up uh, being able to save by getting them back right away. I was one of them. Beginning in 1961, the United States supported South Vietnam with troops, escalating to over a half a million soldiers by 1969. Well, they led us up into a valley, and then once we got up into the valley, they blocked off both ends of it, and we were right in the middle. And then they poured the firepower on us. The, the man that shot me, me and him, I seen him, and we shot at each other for more than two hours. Of course, I was dug in pretty good, and so was he. But then they were bringing in a helicopter to pick up the wounded. And uh, when we popped our smoke to bring in the chopper, he landed right between us. And when he landed between us, not 60 yards away, there was an enemy machine gun. And after fighting for three hours, the machine gun never shot a shot. But when the helicopter came down to land, he opened up and he shot the, the uh, two men on the one side of the helicopter. He killed them. The helicopter crashed, the other two guys got out, and they were running towards our position. And I seen the, the machine gun, I raised up to shoot, and when I emptied my clip into the machine gun, the man that I was shooting at prior to that, he shot me twice through the chest. And I hit the ground with uh, yelling and screaming. I mean, it was, uh, it was a traumatic experience to, be, to have the bullets go right through you. It felt like I was hit with a sledgehammer. The pain wasn't so much but just the numbness. And to look down, my intestines were sticking out of my body, and I laid there for just about three hours until we could get somebody in to get to me, to, to bring me out. I remember laying in the rice paddy, and I could extend my arms, and I could splash my own blood. 
And I laid there and just prayed to God, prayed to God that I could make it out. And then after a while, a friend come out and he says, come on, Tom, we're going to go. And he started to pull me while my ribs were shot off and I had exposed, my ribs were sticking out my sides. And when he pulled me, the pain at that time was so tremendous. I says, I can't do that. Stand me up. And he says, you can't stand up. They'll shoot you again. And I said, stand me up. And they stood me up. And I was walking. And the bullets were whizzing by my head. He laid back down. He was crawling. And I was walking. And it was, uh, and it was an experience that I relive quite often to the splashes around me, to the screams of the battle. And I walked about 75 to 100 yards until uh, there was the uh, waiting chopper. I also was overwhelmed by violence, and I still am. I, I think all violence is the same, and I had a heavy dose of it in Vietnam, and I saw the end result of violence. And when I came home and saw people fighting with each other, I, I was overwhelmed by it. I went to a hockey game one night, and a fight broke out on the ice. And I sat in the stands just sobbing while all the people were up cheering for this fight. And, it, and it's all the same, whether you point a gun at somebody, drop a bomb on somebody, or punch somebody, it's all the same. My son was proud of the fact that his mother and father were veterans of World War II. He started talking to me about the Vietnam War. He said, Dad, that war is wrong. And my daughter, too. And then my, my son and my daughter were at Kent State University. One was a sophomore, one was a freshman. And the anti-war movement was all over the country. They burnt 14... ROTC buildings all over the country, and you only heard about Kent State. Pretty soon I start listening to my kids, and they're saying to me, Dad, this war is wrong. I start saying, well, maybe my kids are right. And then on May the 4th, 1970, the son of two World War II veterans was shot down at Kent State University for protesting the policy of this nation of going into Cambodia. And the National Guard came in, and on the day that they had a peaceful protest, to bury the Constitution because it wasn't working anymore after Nixon did what he did, remembering that McNamara finally said that war was wrong. He was shot down at Kent State with uh, 12 other students. Under President Nixon, troops began to withdraw in 1973 after a ceasefire agreement was signed, and the war ended in 1975 with a communist victory. Militarily, we won every single major battle we ever fought over there. We should have. We had much better equipment. We had much better technology. We, uh, you know, air power and firepower and that sort of thing. So we, we basically won every single battle that we ever fought over there. Uh, we lost the war politically. We lost the war politically, and we lost the support of the American people. And we really, really, that's where the battle was lost. It was lost in Washington, D.C., not in Vietnam. But unfortunately, today, there's still those people that talk about the, the valiant Viet Cong who beat their plowshares into swords and defeated the United States military. That's, that's baloney. It didn't happen. On Memorial Day in 1958, as the Vietnam conflict was escalating, two more unidentified American war dead were brought to the United States from overseas. Both of these soldiers were interred in the plaza beside the unknown soldier of World War I. One of these unidentified soldiers was killed in World War II, the other in the Korean War. In 1973, a law was passed providing for the internment of an unknown American from the Vietnam War, but none was found for several years. Finally, in 1984, an unknown serviceman from that conflict was laid to rest alongside the others. The most prominent Veterans Day ceremonies occur each year at 11 a.m. on November 11th at the Tomb of the Unknowns in Arlington National Cemetery. A combined color guard representing all the military services executes a present arms at the tomb. It is at this time that the bugler plays taps, a 24-note bugle call played by the military at burial and memorial services. Going into Cordery, there when we started to uh, come into the town, there were a lot of ponchos uh, along the side of the road, and uh, there was probably well over a hundred and some dead under those ponchos, uh, Marines that had been killed and brought back. And uh, although we brought all the equipment back and the trucks and the wounded, uh, they just started to get overloaded with equipment, and they couldn't handle it. So what they did is they unloaded the dead 
and they stacked them up alongside the road. And uh, a dozer came along, and they did a slit trench. And they put these young fellows in the trenches and covered them up in grave registration, marked the area. And uh, But the one thing I remember about that uh, curiosity, I guess, got the best of me. I lifted the, one of the ponchos off of one of the Marines, and it was a young, red-headed youngster. Uh, and I couldn't help him. That thought comes back to me uh, quite often is that here's a young man that the uh, parents, primarily the mother, uh, never knew what happened to that young lad. And uh, he's still up there. The Chinese, uh, if you follow the writings and the reportings, the Chinese are looking to get $300,000 per body to ex exhume this area of Cordery. The Tuskegee Airmen are receiving recognition now after all these years. But there's only about 325 of us left. And I think about those men who are dead and gone, who never had a person come up to them and shake their hand. And see, and a lot of times that I go to air shows and there are bomber pilots who come up and say, I want to thank you guys, you saved my life on a number of occasions. And they never, they never experienced that. And we were being prepared to be shipped to the South Pacific. Our division, as well as the other divisions, were being fitted up, restocked, and uh, we were preparing to load everything on ships when the war ceased in the South Pacific. That was a great day. The young people today should be aware of the fact that the fact we have a free country today is because thousands of their grandfathers or would have been grandfathers died to make this world free. And our country is free because of it. Whether you're talking about First World War, World War II, Korea, or Vietnam, all these veterans, many of them gave their lives to to keep this country free so that we have the privilege of just what we do today. According to the dictionary, a veteran is simply someone with experience, and at times it is someone with experience who has served in the armed forces. But to the men and women who have risked their lives fighting America's wars, it is much more than that. When I came out of the Army, I had been challenged. What I did was interesting. It was life-threatening. It was life-changing. It was character-building. And most of all, it was faith-confirming and enhancing for me. And uh, uh, I'm a proud veteran. I just am. A veteran is someone who believes in freedom and believes that freedom is important enough to fight for. A veteran is someone who has risked his or her life so that you don't have to risk yours. The thing that I can't forget, never will, we, the guy that was in a foxhole with me was a kid from West Virginia, okay? And he was an atheist, a confirmed atheist. All right, so we're up there in a the foxhole and we're just bombing the hell out of it. Just shells all over, and I'm praying. You know, of course I'm praying. We all were out loud. You know what that kid said to me? He said, would you pray a little louder and a little slower so I could follow you? And he was repeating after me. See, He learned how to pray real quick. Veterans did something that is uh, very special, whether it be in combat or, or in peacetime. They put their careers on hold. They put their lives on hold to, to do what they need to do to uh, uh, assure their country's freedom. I mean, that's not something you can just buy. <laughs> that's, that's a very special thing. Each and every veteran is, in their own way, an American hero. And we should be proud to remember and honor them on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, Veterans Day. I'm very proud of what I did. Uh, I was very good at what I did. I was lucky, very lucky. You could sprinkle a little bit of skill in there, 
but uh, skill didn't save me all the time. It was more luck than anything. So yeah, I'm proud of what I did in the Army, and I'm proud of what we did, the whole Army, everybody from private all the way up to generals, what we have done. You know? and the people that serve in the Armed Forces make a lot of sacrifices, a lot of sacrifices to serve their country. A lot of sacrifices that go unrecognized. I'm very proud of being a veteran. I'm very proud of being a live veteran. They went to war for God and country and mom's homemade apple pie. And even if they were drafted, okay, when they went over there, they were still went into battle, recognizing that they could lose their life. They went into battle because simply for one reason, only one reason, because their country asked them to. To order active duty on video cassette, call PBS Home Video at 1-800-PLAY-PBS. Thank you.